as we continue our study in the book of Revelation. We're rapidly getting to the latter portion of the book of the Revelation. We're in the 12th chapter. We'll be looking at verses 13 through 17, a very brief text today, but a very, very broad subject as we look at those few verses in our Bibles today. Let me remind you, before we read the text, let me remind you that as we study the book of the Revelation, it's all about seeing the Lord Jesus Christ. You've heard me say so many times during the course of these months, as we study through the text, it's not about the signs, similes, and the symbols. It's about the Savior, Jesus Christ himself. As we analyze the Revelation text, we see in Revelation chapter 1, Jesus unveiled. Revelation 2 and 3, we see Jesus in the churches. In Revelation 4 and 5, see Jesus on the throne. Revelation 6 through 18, we see Jesus in the tribulation. Revelation 19, we see Jesus in his return. Revelation 20, we see Jesus in the millennial reign. Revelation 21, we see Jesus in heaven. Revelation 22, we see Jesus throughout all of eternity. So the book of the Revelation is all about the lovely, lifted, life-giving Lord and Savior Jesus Christ himself. That ought to be the focus of our study in the Revelation text, and I find it antithetical to biblical truth with so many so-called theologians today that say the book of the Revelation, uh, the information that it's already passed, or to say that it's not to be taken literally, or to say that somehow, some way, it's just a figurative text and not to be understood in a theological sound conservative sense. And I just happen to disagree with that because I believe that God gave it to us for a purpose when he told John as John was banished to the Isle of Patmos because of his witness for Jesus and because of the word of God and the refusal to bow and say the emperor is Lord. As a result of that, John is banished to the Isle of Patmos, that uh, craggy, rocky, uh, eight uh, mile by about 10 mile uh, little uh, island out in the Aegean Sea. As he's banished there and God tells him to grapho, that's the Greek word for write, and to write it down. He was given a total journey through the past, present, and future to the very end of the world, and God told him to write it. We have the benefit of reading what he had written as a result of his uh, giving, being given that, uh, uh, going to the very portals of glory and being given the understanding of what's taking place even in the latter days. Uh, Revelation, the 12th chapter, verses 13 through 17 concludes the broader unit of thought which is found in Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12 is picking up on Revelation chapter 11, the 15th the verse where it goes into the seventh trumpet sounding. Seventh trumpet sounds and it goes into the seven vials of wrath uh, throughout the balance of the book of the Revelation. But we're talking about today and I pray that you noticed in that uh, last song uh, that we had before I stood up, it was a uh, Jewish song and as we look at the text today, we're talking about why the Jews are so hated. Why the Jews are so hated. Perhaps you've recognized that. Some may have not recognized that. But uh, the uh, Satan is the enemy of God. Ever since the battle cry or the uh, throwing down of the gauntlet, if you will, in the Genesis text, the third chapter, ever since that point, there's been a battle between good and evil, a battle between God and Satan, a battle between uh, the Savior and uh, the saints uh, is played out in the hearts and the lives of individuals by Satan himself. It may I remind us the spiritual battle that's been raging all these centuries is between God and Satan. And Satan, however, is a defeated foe. As we understand the biblical record, Satan is a defeated foe. But yet on earth today, he's alive and well. And as a result of that, he's out to tear down and destroy anything that God wanted to do in your life and in my life and the lives of others. He is a defeated foe, but he's alive and well on planet earth. He hates God. He hates every child of God, and therefore he is out to destroy the believer. If you don't believe that, may I just insert at this moment a very relevant illustration of Satan's hatred of the Christian, the church, and of anything that is good and godly. Uh, Jerry Falwell has just uh, uh, re uh, stepped down as the head uh, of the uh, Liberty University. He did so as a result of some very, very uh, sad events. Now, I'm saying this not to demean Jerry Falwell. I'm saying this simply to bring out a relevant truth of how Satan is out to tear down and destroy, and he will find the weakest point at the most unsuspecting time to trip us up and to destroy our witness and our testimony for the Lord Jesus Christ. 
as a result of showing photographs on his Instagram of on being on his yacht where there's some uh, unseemly picture being made of uh, Jerry with his arms around a young lady that was not fully properly dressed and as a result of what he was holding in his hand that he said was just dark water whatever that means uh, he uh, was evidently beyond himself in that uh, event and as a result of that the board asked him to step down indefinitely and I say that not out of any ill will for that institution they've done a marvelous job not any ill will for the man himself but to vivify for us how Satan is out to tear down and to destroy Perhaps you've wondered why it seems sometimes that events take place in your life that you wonder, how in the world is this happening? Why did it happen? Why did this take place with me? It's not because you are unique. It's not because I have a particular thing that you have or have not done. It's simply because that is the methodology, the modus operandi of Satan in the world today. He is the arch enemy of God. And if we have said yes to Jesus Christ, we become, we are sons of God, according to John 1, 12. If we become sons of God, then the Lord Jesus Christ is operative in our lives. And as a result of that, we are targets with the target on our backs, if you will, for Satan and his hatred for the Christian and for anything that's good and godly. But the nation, the race of people, the ethnic group of human beings on the face of the globe, that Satan hates more than any other group of individuals or human beings is none other than the nation of Israel, the Jewish people. As we've seen in verses 1 through 12, in this chapter we see that Satan was kicked out of the heavenlies. Let me restate that. Satan was kicked out of the heavenlies. That'll take place at approximately the halfway point of the seven years of tribulation. The seven years of tribulation, many times you've heard it called three and a half years of tribulation. Last three and a half years is generally referred to as the great tribulation. It's because of the intensification of the work of the Antichrist, the one that is referred to as the lawless one, the one that is referred to as the wicked one, the son of perdition, the little horn of Daniel 7, the beast, the dragon, the old serpent, the devil, and Satan himself, the lawless one as a result of the Antichrist and what he's doing during the days of the tribulation. He is wreaking havoc on the whole globe. But the first three and a half years, if I can uh, digress for a moment so that you'll better understand it, and I happen to have an intimate knowledge of this particular author here that uh, wrote the book, The Panorama of Prophecy, uh, and in this uh, book there's about uh, uh, 200 and uh, some odd pages, right at 200 pages, that outlines the... Uh, prophetic future from the rapture of the church through the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. But on page 62 and following... I write the purpose of the distress. Why the tribulation? There's a twofold purpose in the tribulation. This is the reason we find three and a half years and three and a half years, the total of seven year period. This is a precise purpose for a precise purpose for the distress, the tribulation, the lupsis that will take place. That is the pressure, the problems, the difficulty, the danger that will take place during the days of the tribulation. The first three and a half years is for the retribution of the lost world. That is the retribution of the lost world. It's where in general uh, uh, God is dealing with a world that said no to his son, Jesus Christ, and bringing about the thelupsis, that is the word for tribulation, that is the pressure, the problems, the difficulties, the danger, the devastation that shall take place. And that is to bring about uh, for the whole world to recognize that Jesus Christ is God. The second half of the tribulation is the reception of the living word. And I write, first the tribulation is for the retribution of the lost world, that is retribution. The second three and a half years is for the reception of the living word, that is for redemption. The last half of the tribulation the last three and a half years is where God is explicitly dealing with the nation of Israel to get Israel to the point of wanting to say yes to Yeshua Messiah. In the 12th chapter of the book of Zechariah, the ninth verse and following, that's exactly what takes place. When it seems as though the nation of Israel is going to be eviscerated, totally destroyed, it's what triggers the throne of the Lord Jesus Christ. He leaves his throne in glory and he returns to destroy the enemy of the church, the enemy of Christ, the enemy of, the, uh, of uh, God's people and destroys them with the sword of his mouth, Revelation chapter, uh, what is that, chapter uh, uh, 17, verses uh, uh, 17 through 21, 19, 17 through 21, uh, left page, right column in my Bible, and he destroys them with the sword of his mouth. And may I remind us, as we look at this text today, we're looking at literally that which causes the uh, world to hate the Jewish people. Now, the Christian ought not to hate the Jewish people. 
In fact, if they are successful as they're trying now, thousands of people gathered in the streets of Jerusalem in the past several days. They've been doing it for almost nine months, trying to dethrone and to remove Benjamin Netanyahu as the prime minister of the nation of Israel. If they're successful in that, if, if the Globe and George Soros and his daughters are successful in removing President Donald J. Trump from the President of the United States of America, we will see America cease to uh, take uh, Israel uh, under our wings and protect the nation of Israel. And once we do that, the blessings of God, the hand of God's blessings will dissipate and be removed from over America. We need to recognize the danger, t- dangerous times that we're in. Uh, for example, it's not an unusual thing to see Jew hate. I've seen written on the sides of Jewish synagogues, think extinction. Uh, Jews go home. Swastikas painted on the sides of the walls. Uh, Jews are called monkeys and pigs. In fact, recently the United Nations issued an edict that states that the entire Jewish Temple Mount belongs to the Arabs and not to the Jews. Most of the Arab scholars, so-called as they're called today, they will say that the Temple Mount never had a temple on it. It is all, They say that it's always belonged to the Arabs and not to the Jews. Jews from around the world are regathering and coming back into the nation of Israel. It is God's homing device in the hearts and the lives. I'll never forget. One of the most uh, unusual scenes that I've ever witnessed in my life, watching during the late 90s when they had the uh, great airlift coming out of Russia and the Ukraine bringing the uh, Jews back to their homeland. On one of those occasions, one of the giant uh, jumbo aircraft uh, uh, deplaning on the tarmac with the Jewish people uh, coming down the steps, one of the elderly Jewish Orthodox Jewish men, uh, still with his uh, uh, long tail jacket on, with his, uh, I call it his curls, his braids hanging down the side of his face. As he deplaned and got off the final step, he fell on his face on the tarmac, kissed the asphalt. One of the reporters asked him, Why are you coming back to Israel? And in his Yiddish, broken English, I do not know. I just know there's something in here that drew me back to Israel. Israel. And may I remind us that ought to be the position that we take today in the realization and the recognition of Israel being the apple of God's eye stated four times in the Word of God. It is the apple of God's eye. And anything that attacks and tries to do away with the apple of God's eye, God through Jesus Christ will bring about that vindication of His people, the Jewish people. Now, may I remind us as we look at this text, we understand that Satan realizes after he's kicked out of the heavenlies into the earth and becomes literally Satan incarnate through the Antichrist, which is what you see when you look at Revelation 12, verse 7, 8, and 9 in particular. Satan realizes that his time is short. He's as a caged lion wanting to viciously lash out. He, his hatred and his malice is focused on the Jewish people. And may I remind us in that cage line, he's cruel, he's crushing, he's vicious, and he is on the attack. And that's where he is today in relationship to the Christian, the Word of God, the child of God. This is the right reason you see Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer and AOC in the crowd that is being uh, used as puppets by Satan himself. It's a demonic battle that's taking place in Washington and thus blanketing the United States of America and over the globe today, trying to crush out and destroy anything that is Christ-like and godly. But I want us to understand in these few moments together in verses 13 through 17, I want us to understand why the Jewish people are so hated. Stand, if you will, please, out of honor and recognition of the reading of the Word of God. As I read audibly, follow with me in your Scripture silently. Verses 13 in chapter 12, the book of the Revelation, verse 13 through verse 17. And when the dragon saw that he was cast unto the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man-child. And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle that she might uh, fly into the wilderness, into the, her place where she is nourished for a time and times and half times from the face of the serpent. And the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman uh, that uh, he might uh, cause her to be carried away of the flood. And the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood which the dragon cast out of his mouth. And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed which kept the keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of of Jesus Christ. Thank you, and we may be seated. 
I want us to notice three very brief things in these moments that we have together. I want us to notice, first of all, the satanic persecution revealed in verse 13. Secondly, I want us to notice the sovereign protection realized in verse 14 through 16. And thirdly, I want us to see the satanic persistence recorded in verse 17. Notice in that 13th verse what I simply call the satanic persecution revealed. Notice, first of all, the premeditated assault. The premeditated assault. Verse 13 says, And when the dragon... The dragon, and it's speaking of Satan, the dragon, that is the destroyer, Satan himself saw he was cast unto the earth. He persecuted. Notice for a moment, if you will, please. Satan realizes his time is short. He re- Listen, Satan is not a dummy. Satan is not an ignorant uh, uh, ignoramus. Satan, have a listen very carefully. Satan is not all-knowing. Satan is not omniscient. Satan is not omnipresent. That is God's prerogative only. But may I remind us, Satan realizes at this juncture in this text that his time is short. Let's make a transition from the text and realize that even today, Satan realizes that the time is short. Listen very carefully. The rapture of the church is the next thing in the calendar of God. The rapture of the church could take place at any moment. And at the rapture of the church, the uh, sons and daughters of God, the sons of God, John chapter 1 verse 12, where the sons of God were snatched out of this old world. If you've said yes to Jesus Christ as Savior and as Lord, we won't be here during these days. But understand that when the rapture of the church takes place, it is absolutely uh, imminent from the standpoint of what's going to take place with the Antichrist standing, uh, standing up and being brought to the forefront. We're watching the stage being set. We're watching the rehearsal today of what shall take place. I don't know how many of you recall. Many of you do not because of age, and I understand that. When you're nearing 100, you understand some things that you didn't understand before. <laughs> but uh, when you look back to the old theater, and most of them in the downtown city squares, an old theater. In that old theater, you had the sloped floors. You had the old uh, theater seats uh, that would fold out to sit on. And you had the gigantic platform up here, the stage. The stage is set. You're there to watch a play. And then about five minutes before the play, the uh, uh, velvet blue or the velvet red curtains would go back. The uh, shears are still there. And in the last few moments before the shears open, you're able to see through the shears as they're putting the chairs in place and the final actors getting in place for this first scene to take place. We're at that position today. We're watching as it were though, as though the uh, uh, curtains have been pulled back. We're looking through the shears and seeing so uh, darkly but so clearly what is taking place with these final days. We understand that as we see the text, Satan is the one that is the theme and the thesis of what's being pointed out here and how he hates the nation of Israel, the Jewish people. But it's as a result of Satan realizing and recognizing his time is short. He realizes at this juncture he's got about three and a half years before his time is over. He realizes that time is short. In fact, Satan knows that eventually he's going to be cast in to that place called hell. Revelation chapter 20 verse 10 reveals that to us. Let me read that. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone. It's called Tartarus in the Greek text, which means fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are. They've already been cast there. Revelation chapter 19, verses 17 through 21. And now Satan is cast into that place called uh, uh, lake of fire and brimstone, and the beast and the false, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and forever, infinitum forever. Anything that you see talking about hell, you'll see also about heaven. It is eternal. It is not something that you just dip your finger in the hot water and it's gone after a few minutes. That's not the point at all. But one day Satan will be cast into that place called hell. But in the reality of the uh, relevancy of the text that we're in, Satan has already been kicked out of the heaven. Let's listen very carefully for those that did not hear last uh, study in this text. Satan... At the point of the book of Job, Job chapter 1 and 2, Satan is able to go into the throne room of God and meet with the angels of God and have a dialogue and discussion about Job and how God is praising Job for his faithfulness. He uh, fears God. He's faithful and upright and uh, skews all evil. And as you know, the battle took place there, but it was as a result of God giving Satan permission. 
But uh, as you look at uh, Isaiah chapter 14 and Ezekiel 28, you understand that Satan was cast out of heaven at one time because he said, I will, I will, I will, exerting his will over the will of God because of his pride. Five times he said, I will. He's cast out of the very abode, uh, the boardroom, if you please, of God, the very abode of God, the very presence uh, of God. He's cast out of the nuos, that is the holy of holies where God's abode. He's cast into the heavenlies, according to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 2, and other texts. He is the prince of the power of the air today. He's the one that's moving and motivating and pushing through his demonic dissension in uh, Washington and in uh, the boardrooms uh, of our political leaders and the civic leaders across America. They think that they're making decisions, but they're doing so out of the motivation of that which is a demonic determination of what Satan is wanting to do in whipping this world into a frenzy to bring about fright and hysteria and fear to divide the people and to allow our constitutional republic to be destroyed by the satanic, demonic, Marxist, communist movement that's in the world and very clear and very real today. But Satan is right at this very moment awaiting the fact that he is going to be cast into hell, realizing his final frenzied, uh, premeditated pursuit uh, to persecute, to hurt, that is to to tear down, destroy, and to pursue the Jewish people is coming to an end. Not only do we see the premeditated assault, but notice the pointed assault in verse 13. He persecuted the woman which brought forth the man-child. We talked about that in the previous study. Who is the woman that brought forth the man-child? Israel is the nation, and any nation is always referred to in the feminine gender. We realize that the nation of Israel is being persecuted, the Jewish people persecuted today, as a result of bringing forth the Lord Jesus Christ. Because of Israel, the Jewish people, we have today the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, which was birthed as a Jewish man. And by the way, there are a lot of folks today that get upset when they see uh, Jesus portrayed in a Caucasian sense, where Jesus is per portrayed with bronze skin. In fact, there are those in Antifa and Black Lives Matter that has nothing to do with skin pigmentation, but all to do with the socialist, Marxist, communist agenda to tear down America. As they're doing that, we have the nation on its heels and uh, multitudes today that are falling behind the BLM thinking that that's something to follow because it's a political thing to do. It is satanic and demonic in what's being carried out, and that's part of the Marxist agenda to cause hysteria and fear, and as a result of hysteria and fear, we will receive and welcome anybody that steps on the scene and says, I can bring you peace, and I have the answer to all the ills of society. And that's where we're, what we're watching as it is taking place today. But the point of assault, he is persecuting the woman, that is persecuting Israel, persecuting the uh, Jewish people. Notice two things. Notice his anger, and notice his anti-Semitism. His anger. He's angry with God. He's angry with Israel. He's angry with the Jewish people. Listen very carefully. May I remind us we're watching Jew hate on a national level. Let me just give you a couple of blurbs in relationship to that. Jews worldwide are more imperiled uh, than they have been for decades. A new study shows that worldwide incidents of anti-Semitism from vandalism and arson and beatings and burnings are twice as frequent today as history past. And further in the article says records that the anti-Semitism events reached their highest level last year since the university started keeping records on them back in the 1980s. Another article then points out Swastikas and other uh, taunts uh, have appeared on the sides of the Jewish fraternities and sorority houses. Most frightening of all, some of, some of them that cut the brake lines of a bus that was supposed to take children to a Jewish day camp. And it goes on to talk about all of the Jewish attacks that's ha taking place on a national basis. You don't see that on the news anymore. If it were something that's taking place in a mosque where it's the Islamic jihadist that wants to tear down and destroy America and murder every Jew in their aim and sight, it would be all over the news. We find today that the media, in case you're not aware of it, let me give you a little uh, tutelage on that subject. The media is not reporting the news. They're manufacturing the news. As uh, President Obama said three and a half, four years ago, they're fake news. It's fall Fox News. It is not real. And as a result of that, we're getting the uh, wrong understanding of what's taking place on a national and international basis. A Satan is angry with God. And in that anger, he is angry primarily with the ethnic people called the Jewish people, the nation of Israel. His anger is being vented today. He's been kicked out of heaven. And we find that 
in Isaiah 14, 12 and following. He's kicked out of the heavenlies now upon the earth in Revelation 12, verse 7, 8, and 9. But notice not only he's angry, but notice his anti-Semitism. His rage and his anger and his fury is directed at one race of people on the nation. By the way, listen very carefully. Let me remind you the time and the setting, the chronology. We're looking at the uh, early portion of the last half of the tribulation. It intensifies where Satan has already been th kicked out of the heavenlies. He is incarnate now in the man of sin the Antichrist, the lawless one, the one that is called the Antichrist as we study the Scripture. We need to understand that this lawless one, the Antichrist, has total sway, total control, total authority on a global basis. And you study Daniel chapter 7, and Daniel chapter 8, Daniel chapter 11, Revelation chapter 13, Revelation chapter 14, you realize, realize that the Antichrist did not have to come and make war and take authority and control. All the kings and all the potentates and all the princes, all the prime ministers and all the presidents on a global basis surrender their authority to this one that steps on the scene and says, I can bring about peace. Daniel chapter 9, verse 20 through 27, called the uh, seventh uh, year of uh, Daniel, the seventh year of Daniel. It is where the seven years the, uh, that takes place called the tribulation. It is the Antichrist, and at the middle of that seven-year peace treaty that he makes, according to Daniel chapter 9, verses 20 and following, at the middle of that he will break that treaty and will try to destroy the nation of Israel in particular. Israel gave us the Lord Jesus Christ. Satan cannot touch Jesus, so he's going to attack Jewish people on a global, national, international, worldwide basis. The Jewish people have always been persecuted by Satan. The mastermind behind the Jewish persecution will increase in its assaults. What Hitler did in the Holocaust with six million Jewish people murdered by incineration, that will look like child's play. It will look like a picnic in comparison to what will take place in the last half of the tribulation. This is the reason God has placed into the heart and the lives of every Jewish person on the face of the globe that homing device that's drawing them back to homeland, the nation of Israel, Palestine, as it's called in the Scripture. And for your edification, there's no such ethnic people as the Palestinians. It's Palestine. It is the nation that we call the Holy Land today, referred to in the Bible one time as the Holy Land. May I remind us that it's the nation of Israel, the Jewish people, the apple of God's eye that Satan is after. Matthew chapter 24 verse 9 says, then shall he deliver you. And by the way, when you study the book of Matthew, it is written to the Jewish people. It is written to the Jewish people. Then shall they deliver you to be afflicted and shall kill you and ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And the word nations, there's the word ethnos. Notice, let me read it again then. And shall kill you, and you shall be hated of all ethnic groups, ethnic races, ethnicity, for my name's sake. That is what God says in relationship to what will happen with the nation of Israel. Israel has been assaulted, attacked, ever since uh, uh, King Herod attempted to destroy the baby boys to get the baby Jesus. Hitler attempted to destroy the Jews. The anti-Semitism is on increase today. Man recently went into a, a Jewish child care center and shot five people summarily simply because they were Jewish people as uh, they were having their meeting in that center. Jews leaving all of Europe because of the anti-Semitism all over Europe today in Europe, especially in uh, all of the European portions of the nation where they have become, what would you call, Islamicized? In fact, London, England today is owned and controlled by Islamics. The mayor is an Islamic. In fact, they have made the brags about they're going to Islamicize all of Europe. All of Europe today where the Jewish people are being pressed down and hated and persecution, openly persecuted in those streets and those cities. They're by the waves going back to Israel. We find out of uh, Russia and the Ukraine and all of that part of the world, the Jewish people are leaving by the droves and going back to the nation of Israel because it's Israel, the apple of God's eye, the Jewish people that God will be dealing with in the last half of the tribulation to get them to see Yeshua Messiah. And uh, Zechariah 12, verse 9 and following says, one day they will recognize Yeshua Messiah and will weep and wail as over the crying and the in the loss of a firstborn son. And they will say yes to Yeshua, Yeshua Jesus Christ, Savior and his Lord, according to Romans chapter 11, verses 25 and 26. All of Israel, Israel shall be saved. 
And that all of Israel that shall be saved will be that little minuscule remnant that's left. All of the others will have been destroyed by the Antichrist by that point and time. Satan will persecute the apple of God's eye, the Jewish people. But he will not win. Jesus wins in the end. Notice not only the satanic persecution released, but notice verses 14 through verse 16. The sovereign protection realized. The sovereign protection realized. Notice the prompt asylum in verse 14. I call it the prompt asylum. And the woman, that is Israel, were given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly unto the wilderness into her place where, where she is nourished. Notice now how long? For a time and times and half times from the face of the serpent. That's three and a half years when you analyze the biblical text in relationship to the symbolic sense of it. During the last three and a half years of the tribulation, the satanic persecution will intensify against Israel, but God will provide swift, prompt asylum and shelter and protection for her. When it talks about the uh, the eagle's wings, it indicates their swiftness and promptness and the quick protection. Eagle's wings is not a prophecy just about airplanes or jet airplanes. One theologian theologian interpreted said that there would be jet airplanes prepared, they will be able to fly all of Israel out, etc. That's nonsense. It's absolutely hocus-pocus theology. It has nothing to do with the truth of what God's Word says. In fact, you can go to Psalm 17, and I don't have time to read it, but Psalm 17, 6 through 8, talks about the eagle's wings. Deuteronomy 32, verses 8 through 10, Zechariah 2, 5 through 12, talks about the speed in which God brings about His protection as on eagle's wings. In fact, in Exodus 19, 4, God said, Ye have seen what I do unto the Egyptians, and how I bear you on eagles' wings, and brought you unto myself. It's speaking of the safety and the uh, uh, speed by which God will enter in in the protection of the nation of Israel. God's uh, uh, protection is uh, going to be there when the intensification of the attempt to destroy Israel is taking place. Notice three things, two or three things about that. First of all, the protection protection into her place. Literally, God provides a hiding place, if we can use that term, a hiding place, protection for the Jewish people. God is going to do the protecting for the nation of Israel, the apple of God's eye. How long will he do that? The period of time? For a time and times and half times. That's three and a half years. That's 1260 days. That's 42 months. And you find that referred to Daniel chapter 7, verse 24 and 25, Revelation 12, 6, Revelation 11, 2. It's talking about that period of time, the last half of the tribulation, that God is going to provide his protection, his shelter, and he will do so in a speedy fashion for the nation of Israel to make sure that Israel is protected because she is the apple of God's eye. The purpose there, what is the purpose? From the face of the serpent. That is from the face of Satan, the enemy of God, the enemy of the child of God, the enemy of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, the enemy of the Jewish people is none other than Satan. We find Jew hate. And Jew persecution, persecution taking place on the face of the globe. Multitudes of these groups, act like the Islamic jihadists, they think that somehow, some way, we've got to destroy them. Every Islamic person in the Middle East says that their main goal is to push Israel into the Great Sea. That's talking about the Mediterranean. They call them uh, monkeys and pigs, and the idea is that they have no value. They're not worth anything, and they simply need to be destroyed. That ought not to be found in any heart of any child of God. And yet I'm amazed to see the number of Christians that detest Jews, that hate Jews. You know how that came about? Let me give you a little brief theological lesson. The root and foundation of that is Reformed theology. Reformed theology comes out of the 15th century. Reformed theology comes out of John Calvin that says that the church is spiritual Israel, that God no longer deals with the nation of Israel as a nation, but he's only dealing with the church. That's horse feathers. That's a good Greek word. Hogwash, if I can be a little more clear. And this is the reason we find today so many that call themselves Grace Church or Reformed Church, etc., 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 that comes out of the being soaked in uh, John Calvin and Calvinism. 
the major tenet of Calvinism is that you can't get saved by your own free will, that you no longer have a free will, that God created us uh, as uh, beings and as uh, he is sovereign, it's uh, as though he is the puppeteer and we're the puppets and he pulls the strings and uh, we're going to get saved only when God says get saved. Listen, I'm not deteriorating or demeaning from the fact that somehow, some way, multitudes today that God is calling unto salvation, multitudes say no, but it's the Holy Spirit of God that's doing the wooing. It's the Holy Spirit of God that's doing the drawing. It's Jesus Christ in incarnate that died on Calvary's cross that provided the way that we might be saved but we have the volitional choice God created us as volitional beings if you don't believe that go back to Adam and Eve God said don't they did because they exercised their free will and ever since that point in time in the creation, we've all been birthed with a free will. We can make a choice. This is the reason the Bible says, whosoever will may come. This is the reason the Bible says, God is not slack concerning his promises as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all would come to repentance. God's desire is to see everyone saved, but everyone will not get saved because we have a free will. Simply a little lesson on theology. So you'll understand why the Jewish people are so hated today, even among some that call themselves Christian. May I remind us, Jesus cautioned the Jews in Matthew 24 and verse 20. Pray ye, he said, that your flight be not in the winter. Their plight, uh, their uh, fight in the dangerous times will be destructive and deadly. But God in his sovereign provision and preservation will protect and provide for Israel just as he does for each of us today. It's not unique in this, from the standpoint of God's provision and protection for the Jewish people, the apple of God's eye. But God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. If he does that for the Jewish people, what is he going to do for the child of God, the one that said yes to Jesus Christ, the one that is blood-bought, Bible say, born again? We are in his eye, and he is there willing to protect and to provide for us as we allow him to do so and allow him to have his movement and being in our hearts and in our lives. Not only do we see the prompt asylum, but notice in that 15th verse, the persistent aggression. Satan won't give up easily. He does not stop. He's not give up at all. And the scripture says here, and the serpent cast out of his mouth water as, notice now, didn't say it was water and it was a flood of water. It says water as a flood after the woman, talking about Israel, that he might cause her to be carried away of or from the flood. As a flood, not a flood, means aggressive, powerful, rapid in succession. You can watch any of the newsreels on television where there are major floods taking place and you can have a a gigantic building that looks sturdy and strong on a solid foundation and that flood can come in such a torrential uh, form and such power in its rush that it destroys the foundation and literally floats the building down the river as it washes it away. And that's the scene that you see here when it talks about as a flood. It's talking about the extreme danger, the destruction, the devastation that will take place. Most of you have watched some of the newsreels. I enjoy watching the Weather Channel and watching some of the devastating weather that's taken place on a global basis and the horrific things that weather can do with hurricanes and with storms and uh, with hail and floods as they come about. And that's what we see here. In fact, you can look at in your leisure Isaiah 59 and verse 19, Psalms 32, 6, Psalms 69, verse 1 and 2. And it's just a few of the texts in relationship to the devastation that will take place and can take place in relationship to that. In fact, I believe I will read the uh, Isaiah 59 and 19 for our edification. Notice the scripture says, So shall they fear the name of the Lord from the west and his glory from the rising of the sun. When the enemy shall come in like a flood, the spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against him. And it's talking about the blotting out the sins of Israel and the re re restoration of Israel during the days of the millennial reign. But it talks about that coming as a flood. It's a good illustration of that. Satan with the Antichrist leading the Russian armies and her allies against Israel will come like a flood against the nation of Israel. By the way, listen very carefully. I need to insert this at this juncture for the clarification and the chronology. Revel uh, uh, 
In the book of Ezekiel, chapters 38 and 39, it's the war with Russia. It is not the Battle of Armageddon. Multitudes of theologians call that the Battle of Armageddon. It is not. It is where Russia, which is an Islamically led nation, will lead five other Islamic nations. And we find in those Germany, etc., etc. They're right now dominated and controlled by Islam. They will come against the nation of Israel, and it will be a battle that will spread across the nation. But it will be the precursor to the Battle of Armageddon. It is not the Battle of Armageddon. And may I say again at the risk of redundancy, it is not the Battle of Armageddon because in Ezekiel 38 and 39, it will take seven years and seven months, seven months to clean up the dead bodies and seven years to clean up all the weaponry and the war machinery. And if it were the Battle of Armageddon, at the conclusion of that battle would go into the millennial reign. And you're not going to find cleaning up dead bodies and cleaning up the war machinery for seven months and seven years during the millennial reign. It's where Christ rules and reigns and provides uh, for those that have said yes to him as Savior and as Lord, including the Jewish people that have said yes to Yeshua, Messiah, as Savior and as Lord. May I remind us, Satan, through the Antichrist, leading that Russian army into that great battle that we see in Ezekiel 38 and 39, will come also like a flood, the Scripture says, against the nation of Israel. That's the last three and a half years of the tribulation. Verse 16, we see the protective assurance. We can be assured that God will protect his own even today. Notice it's supernatural. Talking about his protection is supernatural. And the earth helped the woman, that's the nation of Israel, and the earth opened her mouth. May I remind us, chapter 11, verse 12 and 13. Let's read that so that you'll have a better understanding. 12 and 13 in chapter 11. And the same hour was there a great earthquake, and the tenth part of the earth city fell. And in the earthquake were slain of men seven thousand, and the remnant, remnant were frighted and gave glory to God of heaven. The second woe is past, and behold, the third woe cometh quickly. May I remind us as we see these things taking place, it is that which God is going to do if he has to open the earth and open the mouth of the earth and allow those that are enemies of the child of God, the enemies of the uh, apple of God's eye, the nation of Israel, the Jewish people, he will will do so. In fact, in Numbers chapter 16, verse 31 through 33, the story of Korah and the rebellion against Moses confronted his leadership of God's people, and the earth opened and swallowed them up. So it's not an unusual thing to understand how God can use through his power as he controls this old world to be that which, uh, tool by which he uses to destroy the enemies of the nation of Israel and the Jewish people. God will intervene and protect Israel against Satan's attempt to destroy the Jews, and he will do so supernaturally. Supernaturally. Secondly, it's not only supernatural, it's sufficient. Notice, and swallowed up the flood. That is the danger, the devastation, the destruction, which the dragon cast out of his mouth, literally the satanic directive that is given. The Lord God's protection is always sufficient. In every time of need, I don't know about you, but every time of need, at the very point of the need, God's not late. He's never ahead of time, but he's always on time. At the very point of that need, God is there to meet your need and to meet my need and to provide through his sufficiency all that he will have for your life and mine. And that same protection, that same provision, God will use during the last days of the tribulation in particular that the uh, nation of Israel, the Jewish people, shall be protected. Jesus promised, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. Jesus tells us, cast your cares upon me because I care for you. I'm paraphrasing the text to apply it. Not only do we see the satanic persecution released and the sovereign protection realized, I want us to notice in verse 17, the satanic persistence recorded. The satanic persistence recorded. God will protect Israel. Satan's plans falter and fall, and he gets angry. Notice the pudilant assault in verse 17. And the dragon, that is talking about the old serpent, it's talking about Satan. It is very, very clear who that is. In fact, in chapter 12 and verse 9 it says, And the great dragon was cast out of uh, out that old serpent called the devil and Satan which deceiveth the whole world. It's talking about the same entity, the same personality, the same person here. It is talking about Satan himself that is provoked to anger, the scripture is telling us, and the dragon, the serpent, that is Satan, was wroth, W-R-O-T-H, outraged. He was ticked off, if you put it in the young blood vernacular. 
gets to the point where he seems it seems as though uh, from his vantage point it seems that I'm doing a battle but I'm not winning it seems as though I'm pedaling the bicycle but getting no place if you put it in the young bud vernacular it is Satan in the realization that no matter how hard I try no matter how much I fight no matter what I do against Israel it's an impossibility for me to win he's been out of shape he's ticked off he's outraged he has white hot anger that's pudilance and he, that is provoked with the woman against the nation of Israel, which is referred to as the woman. Satan is outraged with Israel as a nation and as he fights against the Jewish people, he is what I've called hopping mad as a result of it. We see this hatred today increasing. We see this hatred today increase. What do you think causes the BLM? What's causing the Antifa? What's causing Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer and the others uh, in the socialist Marxist uh, BLM Democratic Party to bow in the rotunda of the Capitol and bow, bow the knee at a socialist Marxist uh, communist organization that's out to tear down and destroy my... It is demonic. It is satanic. That's the only thing that moves and mandates and motivates what we see taking place today in our nation. And by the way, the three women that started BLM, all of them brag about the fact that they are tra highly trained, their words not mine, highly trained Marxists. They said our goal is to remove Trump from office. If we can't remove him from the office, destroy his reelection. And if you look at the six major tenets of Marxism, it is to divide a nation through fear. It's to divide a nation through racism. It's to destroy the family. It is to uh, dethrone God. And that's exactly what we see taking place today through the socialist Marxist agenda that's trying to destroy America. And it's empowered by Satan himself. We need to recognize the enemy that we're battling today and realize it's not just names like Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer and AOC and others, though they are carrying the water, if you please, for Satan and the demonic cause to destroy our nation and to destroy the Jewish people. Not only we see the pudilant assault, but notice in verse 17, the particular assault. It is the Jewish seed, the Jewish seed, and went to make war with the remnant, that is the few, the handful of his seed. It is talking about that remnant that is left of the nation of Israel. Keep in mind, and may I remind us again, at this juncture, about two-thirds of the nation's the globe's population will have been destroyed by the Antichrist. That remnant, that tithe, <laughs> that 10%, that few that's left that Satan is still going to try to tear down and destroy and went to make war with the remnant. His purpose and plan is to make war. Let me just illustrate that further. In chapter 13 and verse 7, we'll get to that pretty soon as we look at the 13th chapter dealing with the unholy trinity in that 13th chapter. The 7th verse said it was given unto him, speaking of the Antichrist, to make war with the saints and to overcome them, and, to, and, the, and power was given unto him, power, authority given unto him, speaking of Satan, giving the power, the authority to the Antichrist, over all kindreds and tongues and nations, and all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, whose names are, his names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Listen very carefully in these closing moments. Satan is on the war path today as never before. But the focus that he's on, the one that he has the bullseye on, if you will, is none other than the Jewish people. He is angry with Israel. Satan makes his final attempt to destroy, to tear down the Jewish people. Worldwide, Satan will destroy and devastate uh, the Jewish people. Hitler will look like a child's picnic in uh, regard to what we will see or what the world will see in the last days of the tribulation. The focus will be on a particular time of Jew. What kind of Jew will that focus be on? Notice not only do we see the Jewish seed, but the Jewish saints. The remnant of her seed, notice, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. You recall in Revelation chapter 7, we'll sit again in Revelation chapter 14, the 144,000 uh, virgin male Jewish evangelists that will be sealed by God and that seal gives the protection that during the last half of the tribulation they can preach the gospel of Jesus Christ without harm, without hurt, without being destroyed. 
And the major, major focus of Satan in the last half of the tribulation will be to destroy the seed of Israel and those that are the saints of God, those that are giving testimony of Jesus Christ, those that have committed, that are committed to the word, notice this, which keep the commandments of God. Whether, or wherever the Bible says that in relationship to it, it's talking about obedience, only obedience. How we need that obedience then, commitment, and the willingness to obey the Word of God. And that is the only way that we'll find victory, and that is through Jesus Christ. Go back a moment to verse 11 of chapter 12. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto death. It is the blood of Calvary that gives us that uh, protection. It is the commitment of our lives unto Jesus Christ, and it's as a result of that commitment that we have the heart's conviction to carry out the task of preaching and teaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. I just made a little marginal note. Oh, how we need this kind of commitment today, the willingness to obey the Word, and that's where we find victory in obedience to the Word of God. Without obedience to the written, revealed, inspired, infallible, inerrant Word of God, there is no victory in the end for the child of God. We need to understand that victory comes in our lives as we say yes to Jesus Christ as Savior and then through absolute conviction and commitment we live our lives sold out and surrendered to the gospel of Jesus Christ. John chapter 12 verse 25 says, He who lives his life shall lose it and he that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto eternal life. Not only do we see the Jewish saints were committed to the word, but they also committed to witnessing and have the testimony of Jesus Christ, literally spreading the gospel, preaching the gospel. And these include, as I said, that 144,000 Jewish evangelists preaching and teaching in Revelation 7 and Revelation 14. Not afraid to witness, not afraid of what someone might say, not fearful of what someone might challenge us with. As I say on the daily radio broadcast, we need to understand the truth. We need to live by the truth, learn the truth. We need to uh, stand for the truth, even if it means standing to death. We need to stand at this hour, perhaps there's no other time in the history of the world. We as Christians need to be salt and light in a decaying, darkened society and stand for Jesus, regardless of what the world says or does about us. Yes, it's dark. But as Dr. Adrian Rogers said so many, many years ago, it's gloriously dark because the rapture of the church could take place at any moment. How have we lived our lives? Have we been obedient to Jesus Christ as Savior and as Lord? May I remind us, if we are obedient to Jesus Christ, we win in the end. Let me just give you a little wrap-up scenario. We're talking about Satan can't destroy the believer. He can attack the believer. He can attack the uh, Jewish person, but he will not be able to ultimately destroy it. You put him in jail, he'll convert the jailer. You burn him at the stake and he becomes uh, partners of Christ's suffering and heirs in their reward. Throw him in the lion's den, he lays his head on a lion and he falls asleep with his foot on a lion for a footstool. You release him and they evangelize the world. You persecute them, and they spread, and they thrive. And may I tell us today, I believe we're going to see, before the rapture of the church, we're going to see a greater, greater, visible persecution of the church of Jesus Christ. But you go throughout all of church history, and when the church is persecuted, it might have to go underground. It might have to hide in the closet, but it is going to thrive, and it's going to grow. The true Christian of Jesus Christ, the true Christian, the one that's been blood-bought, Bible say, born again, will not surrender the gospel of Jesus Christ, but will keep on keeping on preaching and teaching the Word of God, even in the face of persecution, even unto death. As we live in these last days of spiritual warfare raging about us, we must stand up. We must be committed. We must witness and win others to Jesus. There can't be any slackening. There can't be any stopping. There can't be any compromising. We need to take a stand for the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ while we yet can. I know that's a lot to assimilate in our hearts and minds. But if you forget everything else, let me remind us the focal point of the text is that we need to be the witness for Jesus Christ. We need to realize that Satan is on the warpath. Satan is doing battle. But we win in the end. Remember 2,000 plus years ago, Satan was destroyed at Mount Calvary where Jesus Christ said to Telestai, it 
is finished. Salvation is complete. Salvation is available for whosoever will. If you've never said yes to Jesus Christ as Savior and as Lord, would you do so today? If you've never said yes to Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, why not? Why not today? Perhaps tomorrow will never come. If you've said yes to Jesus Christ, the question is, are you obedient to the gospel today? Are you sharing the good news? Are you impacting lives for eternity? If you're saved, that's what we ought to be doing. Would you stand?